Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's really great to be here, and it's an honor to kind of kick off this symposium and kick off this plenary session um, on restoring relationships. And so what I'm going to share today is a little bit of work that we've been doing in the Elwha River ecosystem over the past few years, uh, looking at the establishment of terrestrial wildlife on former reservoir beds following large-scale dam removal. And I'm just part of a large team presenting here on behalf of my co-authors and many other people who've made this project possible. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge right off the top, um, Kim Sager Fradkin and Sarah Sunday Hasarelli from the Lower Elwha Kalam tribe, Katie Goodwin and Kurt Jenkins uh, at the USGS um, alongside myself, and then Patty Happy of our emeritus, uh, wonderful uh, wildlife biologist from Olympic National Park. Okay, and so to get started, I just want to orient ourselves a little bit here into the Elwha River watershed. For those of you who haven't spent much time on the Olympic Peninsula, um, this is the largest watershed on the Olympic Peninsula, um, and it encompasses the lands traditionally, the traditional lands of the Klallam people. 95% of this watershed is in the current boundary of Olympic National Park, and of course it extends all the way into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And in this, this river uh, historically had uh, two dams located on it. Um, the lower dam was called the Elwha Dam. Sorry, I'm trying to best see how I can drive myself through here. Hazel, it might be better if you just. If you'd like to just say slide, me. we can advance. That's fine. OK. Please advance. Slide. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So the, the Elwha Dam was built in 1910 to 1913, um, 7.9 kilometers from the river mouth. And this is outside the current boundary of the park. Um, and the removal of this dam was completed in September 2012. Next slide. And then the Glines Canyon Dam uh, was located within the current boundary of the park, built in 1925 to 1927, before the park was established 21.6 kilometers from the river mouth, with removal completed in fall of 2014. Um, so I'm not going to go through this history other than to say, next slide, that as these dams came out, um, what was left behind was these dewatered reservoir habitats. Um, and this is akin to kind of a large ecological disturbance. Um, these were kind of these barren landscapes. And they, so some of the immediate terrestrial work in restoration of these landscapes was, next slide, first to uh, do some active revegetation work. So planting seedlings and trees and dispersing a lot of lupin seed across both of these uh, reservoir beds. Next slide. And there was also a lot of natural revegetation occurring. And so um, what our work has been uh, with, the, with the tribe and the Park Service and the USGS has been to understand uh, mammalian use and other wildlife use of these areas in conjunction with this restoration of these particular pieces of the Elwha River uh, watershed. Next slide. So 10 years on the, um, the watershed, these reservoir beds look completely different than they did in that first aerial photo I showed. Um, now we have this riparian forest developing, still a very active floodplain, but uh, a lot of vegetation coming in. Next slide. And here's an example also um, with that beautiful lupin that has been established across these reservoirs. Both of these pictures were taken above the Glines Canyon Dam remnant, looking at the Mills, former Mills Reservoir. Next slide. So again, the, the dam removal project, um, you know, again, I'm not going to the huge history. A lot of it was focused on restoration of fish populations and restoration of the river, restoration of aquatic food webs, and um, the revegetation of these areas. Our goal has really been focused on uh, wildlife, terrestrial wildlife and fish dependent wildlife species. The goal of the work I'm going to describe today really was looking at mammalian wildlife presence, relative activity and habitat associations on these reservoirs and upstream Geyser Valley, which is a reference reach I'll talk a little bit more about. Next slide. 
So again, the theme of this talk or the theme of this session is on restoring relationships. Next slide. And there's two ways to think about this. One is restoring ecological relationships. Um, so again, you know, the presence of these dams cut off 95% of the watershed to salmon, dramatically changed this ecosystem. In removing those dams and watching this restoration process unfold, both actively and passively, we're looking at the restoration of these ecological relationships, which I think is kind of exemplified here a little bit by this um, salmon you can see in the foreground that's been dragged up by um, perhaps a raccoon or otter or some other kind of species onto the terraces in the Mills Reservoir. Next slide. So the restoration process we can kind of describe uh, along a continuum. Right after the dams came out, we had this early cereal stage vegetation, as I showed, um, and that was combined with early successional and mobile wildlife um, arriving onto these new habitats. Next slide. As, habit, as habitat restoration has proceeded, um, we've seen more species and wildlife using and shaping habitat and vegetation uh, as riparian vegetation continues to mature. Next slide. And then finally, what we're looking at is restored ecosystem function and moving towards a place where we see nutrient transfer across the ecosystem. We see this linkage between the aquatic system and the terrestrial system, um, as with that salmon kind of getting moved into the terrestrial environment and a restored complement of wildlife species, uh, both the species we'd expect to see there, but also their seasonal patterns and phenology being something akin to what we would have expected prior to the placement of these dams so long ago. Next slide. Um, another big part of the Alwa story, however, is also about restoring human relationships. And that's both human relationships with the Elwha ecosystem and relationships with each other. Um, the process of bringing ourselves to dam removal was a huge one that involved a massive number of groups uh, and different people. Um, here's a picture of the uh, Elwha Research Symposium that took place in 2022, a team of individuals, including students, practitioners, and researchers from the tribe, from academia, um, from state and federal agencies, all coming together to learn and share stories and share research um, and build a plan for how to continue working on the Elwha together. Next slide. And a lot of these relationships have been in place for a while. So I also like to think of it as, you know, continuing to nurture these relationships, these collaborations, these stories that we're telling each other and expanding those relationships. Next slide. And some examples of that are with the tribe bringing together um, the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe has done a lot of recent youth engagement, um, bringing tribal youth up into the ecosystem, teaching them about the restoration process. And of course, um, I have learned so much from the tribe in engaging in this collaborative research about this, this land. And so for many of the tribal youth, some, some of these um, um, folks have never been up into the park and been up into some of these areas that I'll be talking about today and are able to learn about how we study wildlife and um, you know, where, where we're taking this program and just be involved in the research that's happening. And this is occurring both in our program with terrestrial wildlife, but also in other parts of Elwha uh, restoration. Next slide. Okay, so again, our goal here was to look at the mammalian community and we're doing this using cameras. And so that's a little piece of research I'm gonna talk about today. Next slide. So to reorient you again, the three study areas then um, I will refer to as Aldwell, Mills, and Geyser. Aldwell is the dewatered reservoir or restoration area above the former Elwha Dam, Mills above the former Glens Canyon Dam in the park, and then Geyser Valley is our reference reach, which has a fully mature riparian forest. Next slide. So in each of these three areas, as you can see in the map here, uh, we put in 10 cameras. Um, these cameras were mounted on to trees or other kind of structures um, to document and were motion triggered cameras to document uh, use by a variety of species. Uh, we picked kind of random locations within a grid that we had set out. Next slide. 
And then we just left them up from 2021 to 2023, um, checking the batteries and downloading imagery every few months. We then took our full data set and we kind of collapsed it to look at independent detection events. So we wanted to make sure we weren't just counting the same individual that was just sitting browsing in front of the camera. Um, so we put a 30 minute cutoff on individual pictures of different species. We also wanted to look at what um, our species detections were associated with. So we had a number of covariates, including the view shed or the area that the camera was covering, distance from the forest edge, the mature coniferous forest edge, uh, which study area we were working in, Aldwell, Mills, or Geyser, the um, year of the study, in case there was a year effect, and then the seasons. And these are our calendar seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. For six species, we had enough data to do some statistical modeling using generalized linear and mixed models. And for all species, we we're able to provide summaries by the number of functional trap nights. And so this allowed us to correct for dead batteries or camera failures that otherwise might have affected some of our detections. So I'm going to jump right into the results. Next slide. Um, once we took out our humans and dogs, um, we had 15 mammalian species that we detected throughout uh, our course of our study, including our large mammals, such as black bear, elk, deer, and cougar, um, down to our smallest um, detections, um, some of our squirrel species, and then our mid-sized carnivores and mammals. Um, so here, I'm not going to have you rely, look much at these numbers, other than to say that there was variability across uh, the three different study areas for pretty much all species, um, and a big variety in the numbers of detections we were getting. I'm going to dig in now to um, some of the results for species for which we had a little bit more data. So I'll go to the next slide. All these figures are going to look exactly the same, which is kind of boring, but at least comparable. And so we've got the season on the x-axis, summer, fall, winter, and spring, the number of independent photo events per trap night, per functional trap night on the y-axis, and then we've got our three um, study areas, Aldwell, lowest in the watershed, followed by Mills, and then Geyser, our reference reach that is unimpacted by the dams and dam removal. So here's our results for black bears. For the next several slides, these are all species where we found a statistically significant effect of both season and of the study area. So as evidenced here, we see a lot of bear use in the spring, a little bit less in the summer, and then it kind of tapers off in fall and winter. We also see our highest use in our reference reach in Geyser Valley, um, followed by Mills, and then lowest in the Aldwell study area. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is an uh, exciting um, use of bears, of mills by bears in the wintertime. This is something we've never documented before and includes um, even some evidence of fishing as recently as a couple of months ago. So really interesting to see and potential expansion of some of that fall use. Next slide. Uh, deer, this is a completely different uh, y-axis. It goes four times higher. These are by far the most um, commonly documented species in our study system. Again, uh, higher use in mills and geyser relative to Aldwell, uh, high use in the fall and the spring, but pretty ubiquitous species. Um, we think that some of the deer use in Aldwell might be lower because it is surrounded by a more human-dominated landscape with lots of watered lawns and other habitats, safe habitats for deer to use relative to the areas uh, within the park. Next slide. Here's our results for elk. Again, we're seeing that higher use in geyser then Mills, then Aldwell. So again, a lot of positioning um, across the watershed, um, the lower part of the watershed um, with high use in the fall and spring and a little bit less lower in winter. So we're seeing these similar patterns um, for deer, elk, bear, and then next slide, please. But then as we look, shift into a diff very different species, we start seeing some different patterns emerging. So this is snowshoe hare. Um, here you can see that by far and away, the highest use is in mills, followed by Aldwell. And this is this makes sense because these are areas of active revegetation. Our snowshoe hares, they like to be in areas that have um, lower cereal stage vegetation, some of that deciduous um, vegetation. So it's a great place for this um, kind of common species in this prey species to be detected. And this is particularly exciting because snowshoe hares are a really important prey species for fisher. Next slide, please. 
And in the second year of our study, we did document a fissure. It's got a snowshoe hair in its mouth um, on the Mills Reservoir, which is where we saw that most of that use. Um, and so the these habitats are providing a great habitat for these prey species. And also then um, we're, we're seeing this use by this kind of elusive carnivore that was reintroduced and um, to the peninsula in 2008 to 2010 after decades of extirpation. So that was really exciting to see. Next slide. Whip through a couple more species here. Bear with me. Coyotes, uh, totally different. Um, almost all the use we see is in Aldwell. Again, Aldwell is outside of the park. It's kind of surrounded by this more human dominated landscape. Coyotes are not native to the peninsula. Um, and they're also, you know, commonly found in urban areas and in human dominated areas. So interesting patterning. We did detect one up in Geyser um, and we know that coyotes do use the park. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how these patterns change over time. Next slide. Uh, finally, bobcats was the last species we were able to kind of statistically model, uh, although we did see this effect, again, of season and uh, lake bed, a little bit less pattern immersion with more even and ubiquitous use across all three lake beds and in all seasons. Next slide. And then finally, I wanted to include the cougar. Um, we didn't have enough data to do a statistical model, but from the, the results here, you can see, again, a similar pattern to what we see with bear and elk. Um, with this higher use in geyser, followed by mills, followed by Aldwell, um, and then some differences across the season. And so these results are also helping inform our greater understanding of cougar use across the peninsula um, through another project called the Olympic Cougar Project uh, that the Lower Alawaklalam tribe and a number of other tribes in addition to Panthera are involved in. Next slide. Finally, the other species, as I mentioned, um, a lot of rare, more variable, but still really fun to, to pick them up um, and just kind of see where they're where they're showing up. Next slide. So really, um, these results from this two-year study show a diverse use of species, diverse species use across all three areas. Um, we see some strong evidence. Um, of differences across seasons and study areas um, that can kind of serve as a baseline for our understanding of the use of these systems. We didn't see any effect of year, um, of distance from the forest edge, of view shed. So it really, really was the seasons and study areas that kind of drove the, the variation in what we saw. We have some evidence that we're seeing expanded use for certain species, um, such as the deer, elk, and, and bear, relative to some earlier studies we've done in the ecosystem. So this really sets the baseline for future work. These dams have been in for, were in for a really long time, and it's only been 10 years since they've been out. Um, we still have a lot of restoration happening and a lot of relationships continuing to develop. Um, so next slide. So this work really is part of a larger program that we have documenting um, and studying the use of wildlife in these areas. Um, next slide. And this has included a series of studies that were done before dam removal. Next slide. And a series of studies during and after dam removal. Um, and these have looked at different groups of species, and we have other collaborators and connections of people looking at other species. Um, so we're really just kind of trying to add to the piece of this whole ecosystem restoration through the wildlife lens and how this fits into what's going on in the Elwha. Next slide. So I'll finish by talking about, um, again, this idea of restoring relationships and ecological relationships. Um, so this is a cougar uh, from the Olympic Cougar Project on Mills. Um, Hazel, does the video, did the video, did you, Put it in or not. And if you can, can you play it? And if you if you can't, then that's okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So when we think of restoring ecological relationships and that whole ecosystem function, this is kind of where we want to get. Um, it's the idea of this terrestrial wildlife um, interacting with and hunting and moving these fish um, and connecting that kind of terrestrial and aquatic environment and thinking about all the nutrient transfer and all, all of what that means going forward. Next slide. 
And this is just a still of that. Um, and I was going to say that this uh, cougar called Kukitsa um, and is one of the many cougars as part of that project. Next slide. And then again, this is all part of this idea also of restoring and expanding and deepening these human connections um, to this to this work. Um, whether it's an engaging uh, youth from the Lower Elwha Kalam tribe in this research and education, whether it's engaging in participatory and citizen science, and whether it's connecting as a scientific community or connecting across different groups um, to learn from each other and to build this relationship um, in our understanding of the Elwha going forward. Next slide. And so that's it. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the many, many people um, who helped maintain um, our cameras and uh, put them up and take them down and manage the data set uh, and everything else. Um, we've had just uh, numerous people involved in this project. Um, thank our funders, the Fish and Wildlife Service Tribal Wildlife Grant Program um, and other support coming from the tribe, the Park Service and USGS. And then next slide, I will take any questions. We did see birds too. Feel free to drop a question in the chat too. Amazing presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You're getting lots of applause, <laughs> virtual applause. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Does anybody have a question? Oh, did did you correlate animal with plant species? Um, we have done a little bit of work uh, previously, uh, just not with plant species in particular, but we were looking at uh, associations of the small mammal community um, in relation to kind of the revegetation and so kind of how much understory and overstory vegetation there was and just saw some differences between um you know our mice who were fine being out in the open areas versus the voles and shrews who needed a little bit more overstory and that's kind of some ongoing research um we might be seeing some slightly different patterns now um but that that's one area with this current camera study uh, we just kind of characterized where each camera was, but we didn't ask any sp specific questions about any specific vegetation. Most of the species we looked at are pretty wide ranging and moved across the whole area. See, we have somebody on camera. Go ahead and ask your question. Nope. <laughs> oh, they left. Okay, that's all right. We have another one in the chat. Have the fishing rights of the lower Elwha Klallam people been restored on the Elwha? Um, there has been, um, yeah, I think this, um, there has been restoration of the fishing has, has, has begun. Yes. All right. Do you know if there is any research being done planned for restoring ethno-ecological relationships? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I personally do not know of any research being done at this time. Um, although I'm not aware of everything that's happening. And so there might be something else. And I would encourage um, my tribal um, colleagues to pop a note in the chat if you know of anything that I might not be aware of. Okay. I can take three more questions. We're, we're going to call it at 1040, but um, someone at no effect of distance to edge for Fisher or end too small? Well, we only saw that one Fisher one time. Um, but, you know, the again, these areas relative to the home range of a fisher are, are tiny. And so, um, you know, that we would expect that they'd be moving through them um, pretty easily. And uh, previous work that we have done on the fisher restoration across the Olympic Peninsula has shown that fishers really their greatest um, occupancy has actually been detected on the edges between um, these kind of areas that are mature forest, which are important for denning, and areas that are more open, whether, you know, in a, in, a mod, in a managed landscape, it could be kind of a clear cut or managed forest. 
um, because those are the areas that have that higher prey base. And so we do see that kind of use really of that edge as an important part of um, of their use of these landscapes. Okay, great, thank you. Someone says, great presentation, thank you. And any sign of beaver? So much sign, yes. Um, we did initial studies, you know, starting in 2014 through 2016. And, you know, the first year we only saw sign in Aldwell. Uh, by the second year, it was showing up in Mills. And by the third year that we did surveys, it was just completely ubiquitous. And some of these um, places where we've actually set up videos is because um, we have these beaver dams that have been created now. And so we can set the video on the dams. And those are areas we're seeing a lot of use by bear and some other species um, as habitats um, that are being, yeah, that are being used by a variety of species. So yeah, they're they're all over the place now. And um, and helping to shape the the restoration of the system as well. Yeah. All right. That's amazing work. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thanks for sharing your work with us today.